In 1927, the photograph entitled Monolith, the face of Half Dome, sparked an awareness for nature conservation the likes of which America had yet to see. Taken by a breakout photography legend whose one cold trip up the side of a mountain path nearly claimed the lives of multiple people. This is Photo History. Now I say one trip, but in reality the photographer of what I'm going to continue to refer to as the Dome was an avid visitor of Yosemite, beginning at a young age. Ansel Adams was 14 in 1916 and had dreams of becoming a concert pianist. He also loved the outdoors and exploring the land around his home on the outskirts of San Francisco. In 1916, Adams took his first trip to Yosemite National Park and was stunned by its beauty, writing in a later memoir, the splendor of Yosemite burst upon us and it was glorious, and that one wonder after another descended upon us. Hard to argue with a man who would later capture views like these. Adams had also talked about a new era beginning for him as soon as he visited the park, punctuated on the trip when his father gave him his first camera, a Kodak No. 1 Brownie box camera, which Adams would use for several years. His early photos exemplified his attention to detail and composition and a really strict eye for tonal balance. But regardless of what you've heard of Adams, he wasn't perfect from the start. During his first attempt at taking a picture of the very same dome in his later masterwork, he fell off a stump and blurred his image. Adams would later refer to this photo as his favorite. Despite the stump incident, Adams kept practicing with his camera and prioritizing trips to Yosemite as he simultaneously tried to keep his music career afloat. He got a job as the keeper of Leconte Memorial Lodge in the Valley of the Park. This is important because it's where Adams learned how to hike and climb to explore areas of the park he had never visited before. But in his excitement, Adams would commonly ignore safe climbing techniques such as belaying, which led the photographer to near disaster on more than one occasion. Years passed, and in 1927, the 25-year-old Adams was in the midst of a major career conflict. He had enjoyed two years as a moderately successful landscape photographer and decided to take the plunge into photography full-time. Adams went all in on a new style of photography which, on the surface, wasn't like any of the more popular photos of the time. The early 20th century was marked by a photography style known as pictorialism a style characterized by the use of soft focus lenses and photo manipulation through the use of darkroom editing techniques to emphasize the beauty of the subject. The goal of pictorialism was for photography to make art and not document a scene. Adams argued that you could do both. He felt that the beauty of what he was seeing in Yosemite was too good to alter its reality in the spirit of pictorialism although some of his photos would still contain elements of photo manipulation. Adams' new style emphasized a rich and luminous tonality, but kept the image sharp using high aperture lenses to document the scene in remarkable detail. So Adams had his style, and now needed his support. With the financial assistance of San Francisco insurance tycoon Albert Bender, Adams had the financial backing required to make his first portfolio in the new style. And it would be called the Parmelian Prince of the High Sierras, a collection of photos covering different landmarks in California's Sierra Nevada mountains. One quick note is that Adams started off angry, not with Bender, who would support Adams in his career for years to come, but with his publisher for naming the portfolio without his consent. It turns out Parmelian was a meaningless word invented by Adams' publisher, who believed that calling them photographic prints would not allow them to be taken seriously as art. Additionally, the word Sierras was grammatically incorrect because the word Sierra is already plural. Tough break. But when it comes to Adams, in the end, all that mattered was the photos. 
which brings us to the Half Dome, a massive granite slab on the eastern side of Yosemite. Adam's goal was to ascend, higher than he had ever gone before, to take a photo of the sheer cliff face. On the cold morning of April 10th, 1927, Adams, his fiance, and three other friends prepared for their half-day trek up the trail. Taking photos in 1927 was no easy task. In a large carrying bag, Adams loaded 40 pounds of gear, including his camera, a handful of filters and lenses, and 12 glass plate negatives, representing the amount of pictures he could take on the trip. His camera of choice was a large format 6.5 by 8.5 Corona View camera by Gunlock Optical Co., made in the early 1920s. It was pretty good for the time, and touted as one of the best outdoor cameras available because of its rugged construction. Despite being the smallest camera in the Corona View lineup, it was more than capable of taking great photos. That is, if Adams could keep it steady. See, he had brought a tripod, but the winds would increase the higher he climbed, causing Adams to waste a few of his negatives on blurry, imperfect photos. Climbing over snowy terrain, he also had an issue with traction, as the experienced climber had decided to wear basketball shoes for some reason. On his journey up the mountain, Adams had already exposed 10 of his 12 plates to varying degrees of success. He was saving the last two for a photo he had visualized of the half dome, but for that, he would have to press on. The diving board is a rocky feature about 3,500 feet high in the mountains of Yosemite. The peak of the diving board sits about three quarters of the way up the half dome, and from this spot, Adams envisioned he could get the perfect photo. And he wasn't wrong, he'd just have to get there first. On his way up the slope towards the top of the diving board, one of his friends slipped on the snow and tumbled down the sharp embankment. He was lucky, ending up with only minor injuries, narrowly missing a potentially fatal descent into the valley. The group collected themselves and continued their trek to the top. Adams arrived in position on the diving board at about noon. At the time, the monolith was covered in a full shadow. Adams asked his group to wait several hours for the sun to give him the light he envisioned. So they did, and the sun moved to cast rays on the mountains in about the mid-afternoon. Adams knew it was time. The first shot fired, and Adams immediately knew something was off. In Adam's time, photographers used colored filters, sometimes stacked, to influence the contrast of an image as well as controlling its exposure. Adams had initially used a yellow filter, which had the effect of darkening the blue sky, but not a considerable amount. The image was a wash, with the side of the mountain coming out gray and slightly overexposed. Adams said he knew the photo was a bust before he even had a chance to look at the picture. With one plate left, Adams took the red filter out of his bag and swapped it into the camera. He took a breath, and he fired. The monolith, face of Half Dome, is a photo which immediately strikes the viewer as spectacle. It's almost surreal in its interpretation. The mountain fills the frame with excellent center composition, and the leading lines move the eyes towards its darkened peak. The sloping valley in the bottom right-hand corner aids in providing the image's depth, and the dwarfish trees at the very bottom help to communicate the incredible scale of the mountain. One interesting bit of camera trickery is that the sky is black in the photo. Adams had notably waited several hours until the late afternoon to the point where the sun was directly hitting the face of the half dome. The actual landscape would have been incredibly bright at this point with the clear white sky sending a reflection down to the snow below. This is where the red filter came into play which had the effect of drastically reducing the amount of light into the camera and upping the contrast of the blue areas in the image. The glow effect around the edges of the dome are also helped by the filter, aiding in framing the subject. Adams had succeeded in capturing the reality and unspeakable beauty of Yosemite in a technically perfect image. Adams knew he had a winning image and a portfolio he could be proud of. The monolith face of Half Dome stood as the feature image in Adams' portfolio which quickly launched him into a successful and highly sought after photographer. His portfolio was printed and sold in small numbers to art collectors, and his photos were mass produced and distributed in gift shops and stores around the park. Travelers could now take home a stunning image of the iconic Half Dome, along with more of Adam's spectacular nature scenes. Adams would continue producing stunning images throughout his career, taking assignments for the National Park Service and brands such as Kodak, Zeiss, IBM, AT&T, and Life and & Fortune magazines. 
In 1980, Adams received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, with President Jimmy Carter acknowledging the committed environmentalist in writing. Today, monolith face of Half Dome stands out as one of the most important nature images ever taken, sparking a conversation about conservation that had pretty much been absent in the early 20th century, taken by a man who wanted to explore and share with others the same feelings he had experienced upon his first trip to Yosemite.